It's April 1919 and Limerick is the very centre of the communist world. In 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution introduced the world to communism. Lenin and his radical ideology threatened Western capitalism and terrified the rich and wealthy. Two years later, Limerick embraced this communist ideal and the Limerick Soviet was born. The word Soviet just simply means a workers' council where you take over your local town or your city and you run the economic and political life of the, of the town or city. What was the event that began the Limerick Soviet? Well, I think we find the answer to that here. If we go across Sarsfield Bridge, across the Shannon, out of the military area and up here to the Union Hospital, which is where I think you can say the Limerick Soviet was born. Well, the Limerick Soviet was sparked by the death of Robert Byrne, who was a leading IRA figure and an active trade unionist in the Post Office Union. Uh, Robert Byrne had been in prison and was on hunger strike when he was moved here to the Union Infirmary. Shortly after he arrived here, the local IRA unit decided to mount a rescue attempt. And during the course of the rescue attempt, a gun battle broke out. Robert Byrne was wounded, uh, an RIC man was killed, and another couple of RIC men were injured. Robert Byrne eventually died from his wounds later that evening. And uh, what was the public reaction in Limerick to that? The public reaction was huge. Between 15 and 20,000 people attended his funeral and there was a huge outpouring of sympathy and anger over his death. And what was the British reaction to the whole thing? Well, the British authorities had regarded the whole incident as an open act of defiance and in response to this, they imposed martial law on the city. They imposed a special military area. And what that meant was that if you wanted to go to work in the morning, if you wanted to go for a stroll with your wife on a Sunday afternoon or even go out shopping, you needed to go to your local military barracks to get a, a special permit. And the people of Limerick just spontaneously decided that they weren't going to wear that. This was not something that they would accept and they moved to a strike. All of the workforce of Limerick were out on strike. They took over the bakeries, they took over control of the shops, regulated the supply and the price of food. And then, in a, in a very radical gesture, they needed money as well, and their solution to that was that they printed their own currency. And of course, this began to catch the notice of the outside world. It, the, it, the news of Limerick spread like wildfire, in fact, throughout Ireland, throughout Britain, and even as far as France and the United States. The city of Limerick was virtually in a state of siege today, following the establishment of... Wire entanglements have been erected at many points. And Limerick as a military area assumed a new and interesting phase today. Very early on, the Dublin Castle authorities offered them a compromise. The compromise was that the local employers could sign their permit to go to and from work without having to go to the British commander. But John Cronin, who was the carpenter who led the Soviet and his colleagues, they rejected this because they weren't prepared to concede the right of the employers to decide who should go to work no more than the right of the, British, the local British military commander. So that was rejected. And like in a lot of disputes, the rejection of the first compromise actually led to an escalation of the dispute rather than heading it towards a conclusion at that stage. On Easter Sunday, 1919, a thousand young strikers set out to test the establishment's resolve. With no official permits and knowing they couldn't get back in, they left the city, only to return a few hours later. They came down from Cahar Davin, down to the Sarsfield Bridge there. The sentry on the Sarsfield Bridge fired a warning shot and immediately the soldiers who were billeted in the Shannon Rowing Club came out onto the bridge the old tank came out onto the bridge and a couple of armoured cars as well and the bridge was secured um, even more so by the British. But the strikers hadn't come for trouble. They came to make a point. After a peaceful demonstration they took refuge in the working class area of Thomengate and the next morning they commandeered the Ennis train and travelled unopposed and triumphant back into Limerick City. Did that end it? No, not by a long shot. They were quite well set up. They could have continued on uh, for weeks on end. And I think that was leading to the, the broader question of 
what was going to happen? Was it going to escalate? Would workers in other cities and towns in Ireland show solidarity with Limerick? So what did uh, other trade unionists do around the country? They did a lot of practical things. They raised money, they sent food. A lot of that went into Limerick from rank and file trade unionists around the country. At the level of the national leadership, they decided they would need to come to Limerick and be at the focal point of it. And they convened a secret meeting in the Mechanics Institute. But if the Limerick Soviet hoped for national support, they were to be sorely disappointed. There would be no national strike. The problem was, of course, now that no general strike was taking place, it was pretty obvious that the Soviet could not be maintained. Within a couple of days, uh, the strike committee declared that any worker who didn't need a permit should return to work. And a few days after that, the British authorities lifted martial law and with no need of passes, the rest of the workers returned to work and the strike finished. Liam, it's a great story, but I'm not quite sure who are the winners and who are the losers. Was it the British, was it the workers? Who came out on top? I think we can definitely say that at the local level, within the city of Limerick, the workers were clear winners because they managed to win back the right that they had been fighting for during the Soviet, which was to freely go about the city without having to get a permit from anybody. But I think if you broaden the picture out more widely than that, you'd have to say that at national level, the workers and the trade union movement were defeated. The result was that socialism died, you could say, in Limerick after the general strike, and it remained dead for 50 years after that. But was there ever a chance that Ireland could have become a kind of workers' republic, maybe something like the Cuba of Europe? For it to happen, the national trade union leadership would have had to get in behind the Limerick workers and escalate it to national level. But they didn't do that. And because they didn't do that, I think we lost the prospect that Ireland ultimately might have become a communist state.